Hey guys, Will here, welcome back to the channel. Now today's video, we're gonna be talking about thermal management inside your computer. So if you've ever wanted to have minimum temperatures with absolute minimum noise, so you don't annoy your housemates, or you wanna have a computer in your room that is processing video or you know crunching numbers somehow while you're trying to sleep, this video is for you. So we're gonna be covering a couple of key principles here from fan cooling, airflow, to water cooling, and lots of the things, lots of little mistakes that a lot of people make with these things. So by the end of this video, you should be fully equipped to get your system running at its absolute most efficient with minimum temperatures and minimal noise. So let's get into it. Now, the first trap that I see a lot of people falling into is thinking that adding lots of extra fans will lower temperatures, and it is simply not the case, as I'm sure most of you that have tried it have found out. Now, the reason for that is basically circulation and airflow. So within a PC, you wanna have air coming in and exiting the case as efficiently as possible. In this case, isn't a particularly good case for airflow, but we've done what we can to maximize the amount of airflow within this case. So what you wanna have is Obviously you've got your temperatures which are increasing inside the case, so you've got your components inside the PC which are introducing heat into the air inside the case. You want that heated air to be exiting as efficiently as possible. So cool air coming in and heat exiting. So most, most cases are set up with a configuration where your cool air comes in through the front and then your hot air exits out the back or up the top carrying all the heat from the various components inside your system with it. Now the reason why they're set up that way is obviously hot air rises, so your cool air comes in at the bottom, your hot air exits out the top, and it's as simple as that, guys. So when you're adding in a whole bunch of extra fans into your system, a lot of the time, all you're creating is turbulence. So what'll happen is, say for example, if I've got these fans here at the top of my radiator running at 100% all the time, the air doesn't have anywhere to go. So what's happening is that hot air is going up, and then it's getting pushed back down again, and it's just recirculating, getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. So the key here again is airflow. You wanna have the maximum amount of airflow throughout your case with a minimal amount of turbulence. So things like blocking off additional ports, this is actually a three port radiator slot at the top of my case here. I've blocked off that top port, so all the air coming up through here has nowhere to go but out, and it can't possibly come back into the system where it gets hotter again. So in my particular configuration, I've got 320 millimeter fans here at the front, which are sucking air in, cool air in from outside, going through my radiator where they get a little bit of heat introduced, going through the case, taking the energy, taking the heat away from all the various components inside the system that aren't being water cooled, and then exiting out the top, through the top of the radiator here, and this area is actually blocked off, so I can't get any recirculation of that hot air. So any air that gets sucked out through these fans has to exit the case. And then I've got another exhaust fan at the back here as well, another 120 mil fan which is sucking out. And it's as simple as that, I've got really efficient airflow throughout the case so I can keep my fans running at a minimum all the time. Now if you've got a air-cooled PC, the principles are pretty much exactly the same. You just need to make sure that any components that have got fans on them within your system all have efficient airflow as well. So obviously if you've got a GPU or graphics card, that's blowing air back into the case. You wanna be trying to take that air away as efficiently as possible. A lot of GPUs nowadays have a fan in them which actually sucks air in, then blows it out the back of the case. And again, the reason for that is so that the hot air is exiting. There's no way that that hot air can get reintroduced back into the circulation inside the case. So again, with a CPU cooler as well, if you've got say a big um, Noctua cooler that's got a big fan on it that's blowing that way, you got your cool air coming in the front blows through the fan, gets heated up by the heat sink. You wanna try and have an exhaust fan directly behind it so that hot air gets straight out of the case. Again, airflow is absolutely key here. We don't wanna be recirculating air. Now, if you get this right and you've got a maximum amount of airflow throughout your case, you can keep those fans to an absolute minimum speed. And you'll find that a lot of the time, introducing more fan speed, all it's really doing is just creating the static pressure inside your case. It doesn't actually cool things down at all. So do some testing with your own setup run your fans at various different speeds and see where that sweet spot is, where you get the maximum cooling efficiency with the minimum noise. So fan configuration really is as simple as that, guys. The two key takeaways are warm air rises, so always have the cool air coming in from low down at the front of the case, picks up the heat and then exits through the back of the case. And secondly, turbulence and recirculation. So you don't wanna be creating turbulence inside your case where the same warm air is gonna be circulating over and over and getting hotter and hotter. 
And you want to make sure that that warm air, once it gets sucked out through the fans in your top radiator or into the top cavity of your case, has nowhere to go but out. We don't want to have any recirculation inside the case because that's where the inefficiency comes in. So what we'll do a little bit later on in this video is I'll actually show you how I've got all my PWM fan curves set up inside my BIOS to maximize that efficiency. But you now understand the basic principles. The two takeaways are maximize your airflow, minimize your turbulence and recirculation, and you'll have a nice efficient system. You don't necessarily necessarily need to add more fans to get more cooling capacity. So the next thing that we need to look at is water cooling. And this is where I see a lot of people making some pretty fundamental mistakes. So the key thing that I want you to understand here is how the water actually absorbs the heat and how that heat is dissipated throughout the cooling loop. So what we'll do here is we'll have a quick look at my water temperatures with this infrared thermometer throughout the various different areas of my case. Now, a lot of people think that when you've got a CPU running nice and hot, so say around 70 degrees, the water coming out of the water block is gonna be really, really hot also. And what you'll see here is that that's actually not the case. The water temperature throughout the loop is pretty uniform. So we'll start off having a look at the water temperature coming out of the water block here. So we'll aim the laser at it. And you can see there the water temperature is 31.1 degrees. We'll have a look at the reservoir. 27.5 degrees where the water is starting to dissipate. It then goes down through the pump, through this radiator. So we'll have a look at the temperature on the fins of the radiator itself. 27.8 degrees. So it's coming through the radiator, back up into the graphics card. So we'll have a look at the water temperature here. Whoops. Get it in the right spot. 26.6 degrees. Other side of the graphics card. And we're not actually doing any stress testing at the moment. So you won't see a massive difference. 26.9 degrees, goes up through the top radiator and then out through this side into the CPU, 28.2 degrees. So there's not a whole lot of variation within the system. And what I'll do now is I'll start a stress test on the CPU here. So I'm actually running my CPU at its maximum everyday use. So 1.45 volts on the vehicle, which is pretty high. So my CPU temperature jumps up straight away to around that 65 to 70 degree mark. And we'll have another look. 30.2 degrees on the outlet. So even though my CPU is running at 65, 70 degrees, the water temperature is still only 30.5 there. And again, you'll see 26.8 on the reservoir, 25.6 on the input to the graphics card, 26.7 on the output of the graphics card, and 28.5 on the return to the CPU. So what we can see there is the, the temperature really doesn't vary all that much throughout the case. So why is that? Now, the reason for that is that the water is obviously wicking away the heat from the various different components in the system, but the body of water overall actually dissipates the heat pretty effectively within itself. So the heat spreads out throughout the entire system because the water is flowing relatively quickly. So you don't get a massive spike in temperature on the other side of the CPU or the other side of the graphics card, even though they're running quite hot. The water does a pretty good job of dispersing that heat throughout the entire system. So you can understand from that, it doesn't really matter all that much what order you put the various different components in your water loop. You don't need to have a radiator directly after a source of heat because that water temperature is going to be pretty uniform throughout the system anyway. The only thing that's really important is that you always have the pump immediately after the reservoir so you don't get a loss in pressure throughout the system. Now you probably noticed that while I was doing that stress test, the system didn't actually get any louder. None of the fans increased their speed. The water pump didn't even increase its speed either. Now there's a very, very good reason for that and that all comes down to thermal efficiency. So basically the basic principle here is that until the heat that's being introduced into the system by the various different components that are being water cooled overcomes the system's ability to dissipate that heat into the atmosphere, you don't actually need to increase your cooling capacity. So there's two things here. It relates to radiators and how many fans or how many what the speed of the fans are, but it also relates to the amount of water inside your system as well. And I've seen a lot of debate about this online. Now, people often think that adding more water to a system actually reduces the temperatures overall. And there's been a couple of videos that have touched on this. I know Jay's Two Cents did one a little while ago. It didn't really explain it in enough detail, I don't think. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail here now. And so as we could see there, the water temperatures didn't increase a whole lot when we were running the stress test. We were only running that stress test for a couple of minutes there, if, if even that. And this system in particular, what happens is when I run a stress test, my water temperature increases over the course of about 15 minutes. 
and then once that 15 minute period has reached, the water temperature basically stays the same. So what's actually happening is it's reaching an equilibrium where the heat that's being introduced into the system by the components isn't more than the system's ability to actually dissipate that heat into the atmosphere so the water doesn't actually get any hotter. So once you reach that point, you actually don't need to increase your fan speed any further because it's not actually going to cool things down anymore. It's not going to run cooler because of that. And adding more water into the system, all that does is it means that it takes longer for that for that dissipation to occur. So if you've got a lot of water in your system, I've got about a litre in this system, and if I, if I was to increase that, what would happen is the water would take longer to reach the maximum temperature, but the maximum temperature would actually remain the same. So if you've only got a small reservoir in your system, your maximum temperatures aren't gonna be any higher. All that's gonna happen is that it's gonna take a little bit less time for those maximum temperatures to be reached. Now, the one catch with this, and the area where people get a little bit confused is that, obviously, a stress test is introducing a, a standard amount of heat over a long or a sustained period of time. Now. With everyday use of a PC, you might have small transient loads where the CPU gets very hot for a short amount of time and then cools straight back down again. Now, if you've got a small amount of water inside your system, obviously the water is going to heat up more quickly. So therefore, you're going to see a larger spike in temperature for a short transient little spike in um, in CPU core temperature. So that's the reason why sometimes people with a, with a system that has less water in it or maybe an all-in-one cooler or something like that might see slightly higher temperatures under transient loads like that. But when you're doing a stress test over a long period of time, you're not gonna see a significant amount of difference in temperature. In fact, the maximum temperatures are actually gonna be pretty much exactly the same regardless of how much water you have in your system. The only difference is how much time it actually takes to reach that temperature. Now that all relates back to the thermal efficiency and the cooling capacity of the fans that are on the radiators as well. And as I mentioned before, you'll notice that my fans didn't actually increase in speed at all when I was running that stress test. So as I mentioned before, until the heat that's being introduced in the system is more than the system's ability to dissipate that heat into the atmosphere around you, you don't need to increase your fan speeds at all. And that's the reason why I didn't need to increase my fan speeds when I was running a stress test just before. So. Again, it's about that cooling efficiency. It's about airflow. It's about the radiators being able to dissipate that energy into the atmosphere around it. And obviously the lower your ambient temperature is, the more heat energy can be dissipated from the radiators. So adding bigger radiators obviously will mean that you will have to run less fan. But overall, until that water temperature starts to run away, you really don't need to increase your fan speed. So the way I actually have it configured on my system, and I'll show you in the BIOS in a minute how I've got everything configured, is that my fans actually don't ramp up at all. They're running at absolute minimum duty cycle right up until the point where the water reaches about 30 degrees ambient temperature. And then every degree after that, I'm increasing the fan speed by a proportion. So what happens is once my water temperature reaches about 34 degrees, it never actually gets any hotter than that. And I'm still only running my fans at about probably 80% duty cycle. We'll have a look in the BIOS in a moment. I'll be able to show you exactly what it's set to. But what happens is because the cooling fans are doing a good enough job of dissipating that energy that's being introduced by the components that are being cooled, don't need to run my fans any higher. So don't fall into the trap of thinking that you need to ramp your fans up immediately relative to your CPU temperature. It simply does not work that way. You're not gonna reduce your temperatures by any significant amount by running those fans at 100%. And you don't wanna have a system that sounds like a fighter jet starting up every single time the CPU spools up. It's just not necessary. So the other thing that we need to talk about here as well is the water pump. Now the water pump I do actually have linked to my CPU temperature. The reason for that is obviously the water's ability to wick away Away that heat from the various different water blocks, the efficiency of that is affected by the amount of water that's actually flowing through the system. And that is critically important. So the less water flow you have, the less heat is going to be drawn away from those components. And because we're talking about smaller surface areas, it is more important. So I actually do have my water pump increasing with my, um, with my CPU temperature. But again, I'm not increasing it until I reach those sort of critical points. So up until about 70 degrees on my CPU, I don't increase it over about 30%. And then beyond that, it increases proportionally until we reach that sort of 80, 90 degree mark where it's running at 100% duty cycle. But anyway, let's jump into my BIOS now. We'll have a look at how I've actually got my water pump and fan curves all set up with my um, pulse width modulation so that everything is running as efficiently as possible. Okay, so I'm running an ASUS Maximus X motherboard, but most motherboards that offer PWM control through the motherboard itself will work in a pretty similar fashion. So so we'll jump down to our fan speed configuration. Scrolling down to my water pump, you can see I'm in PWM mode, which stands for pulse width modulated, which means that the motherboard can actually control the speed of the pump. So my upper temperature is 70 degrees. So when my CPU temperature reaches 70 degrees, 
the um, the pump will be running at 100% duty cycle, which is 100% maximum speed. And then scrolling down to middle temperature, I've got set to 62 degrees. And you can fine tune this to be however you want for your particular setup, whatever your temperatures are typically on your system. So I've got my middle temperature 62 degrees where my water pump runs at 80% duty cycle. And then for my lower temperature 50 degrees, it's running at 55% duty cycle. And what I found is that there was sort of a resonant frequency inside my water pump where it was a little bit louder depending on where I set it. So a slower speed wasn't necessarily quieter. And I found that 55% duty cycle for my particular pump was the point where it was the absolute quietest. But I could run it down as low as 20% duty cycle with, um, with low temperatures and it wouldn't make a difference. So that is how I've got my water pump set up. You'll want to fine tune that to, you know, depending on the sort of temperatures that you get inside your system, but that is just as an indication. The important thing is obviously you have it set to PWM mode. If I set it to DC mode, you'll hear my water pump just ramps up to 100% straight away. So leave it on PWM. We'll go back up to our chassis fans. Now I have every single fan inside my system all running off the same header using a fan speed controller because I don't see the need to control individual fans separately. And I've got it running off the high amp source here. So again, PWM mode, so the motherboard can control the speed. So you see here, my source is a temperature sensor, which I've actually got taped to one of the water pipes below the um, shroud on my system. So down at a cold area of the system where there's no other heat being introduced. And all it's doing is just reading the water temperature through the pipe. So you don't need to have a fancy setup. This works perfectly fine. If you don't have a temperature probe, which you can use for your water temperature, the motherboard temperature also works quite well. That's good at reading the general case temperature. And I find that generally my motherboard temperature and my water temperature are pretty close to each other because the water temperature is generally influenced by the overall temperature inside the system anyway. So we'll leave that on temperature sensor. Now these two step up and step down settings here are like a basically a hysteresis kind of setting. So what this means is that it takes 25 seconds for the fans to speed up from their minimum to their maximum and it takes 51 seconds for them to come back down again. So what that means is on small transient changes in temperature, I don't get the fans going up and down and up and down and up and down. It's a gradual process, so it's less obnoxious in terms of noise. My minimum fan speed I've got set to 600 RPM. That'll depend on the fans that you have. I've got my profile set to manual so I can configure all of the temperatures and loads manually. And similar to my water pump as well, I've got my upper temperature set to 39 degrees. So when the, when the water temperature reaches 39 degrees, the fans are at 100. And as I mentioned before in the video, it never actually goes above 34 degrees anyway. So I never actually need to run my fans at 100% duty cycle. Middle temperature is 32 degrees where the fans are running at 70%. And then anything below 29 degrees, the fans are sitting at a measly 25% duty cycle, which is barely spinning. And again, I've fine-tuned that to, to be the minimum amount of noise for these fans. So there's a resonant frequency where if you go below it, the fans actually get a little bit more noisy. And I found 25% was the sweet spot for my fans. So it's as simple as that, guys. That is how I've got my fan curve set up inside my BIOS. So guys, I hope this video has helped you understand a little bit more about thermal efficiency inside your computer, whether you've got an all-in-one cooler, an air-cooled system, or a custom loop like mine. The same principles apply to pretty much everything. It's all about airflow. It's all about efficiency. So hopefully, you can get your system running as cool as possible with minimal noise. So look, if you do have any questions, please do leave a comment below. I always make a point of trying to reply to every single comment in the comments, whether they're happy, angry, mean, Mean, upset whatever I always try to help and of course we do have our discord channel as well which is linked in the description and of course for our patreon supporters as well I have some dedicated discord channels where I offer one-on-one -on -one support to really help you out with any specific issues that you might be having with your particular build so jump on that as well if you need some help there so if you found the video helpful please do hit that thumbs up button if you haven't hit the thumbs down subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next video and thank you very much for watching see you next time bye